I'm Ruth McKinney, and this year I'm inviting Homeworthy to join my family for all of our annual highlights at Hillside Farm, our 305-year-old farmhouse steeped in history and love. From holiday gatherings to the upcoming wedding of our daughter Avery, we welcome your company as we share in the simple pleasures of life at home. I'll offer tips for infusing your own home with moments of joy, filling home-cooked meals with flavor for the whole family, and of course, decorating with amazing antique finds. So sit back and make yourself at home. Hi, I'm Allison Kenworthy, the founder of Homeworthy, and we're now offering a membership plan that gives our supporters early and exclusive access to new videos. Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Roz. You're here at my home in Los Angeles? Come on in, I can't wait to show you around. With this membership, we invite you to open more doors, discovering new homes, rooms, and personalities available only to those with the keys to our guest house. You'll be part of a community of people who are just as passionate as you are about interior design. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. Welcome Homeworthy. My name is Ruth McKinney. This is Hillside Farm. Today we're getting ready to make a Valentine's dinner for two. Come on in as we get ready. Today I'm excited to celebrate Valentine's Day for my husband Bob and to bring you along with it in all the preparations from the cooking to the setting the table and just to set the atmosphere. I'm even going to have my kids serve us dinner. We never celebrated Valentine's Day. I'm not a big, I never was a big Valentine's Day. In fact, my husband would always say, why do we need to celebrate Valentine's Day? We love each other the other 364 days. I think we said that because we had almost no margin for anything beyond raising kids and flipping houses. And we had no bandwidth. Right now we're sitting in my living room. Our home is about 305 years old. William Penn deeded it 305 years ago. We're the fourth people on the deed. So it's really exciting to be in a place of history where the walls hold different stories. Some of you might recognize the room you're sitting in. I was in a prior episode of Homeworthy. I was fortunate enough about a year ago to do an episode where we went on the grounds and on the property. And for those of you who didn't get to see that one yet, I'll tell you a little about where you are. So we bought this house, and as I said before, it's about 305 years old. When we bought it, it was in complete disrepair. Um, there were woods that encroached all the way up to the house. There were trees growing into the third floor. We didn't even know, I mean, we went to closing because we'd only seen the property one time. And we went to closing and they let us know there were 12 structures on the property, which was so funny. I remember looking at my husband's like, where? But there were two guest houses and a number of other things. So it was for the first year and a half, um, well, even before then, because we closed on our house and on the other house within weeks and nothing was working in this house. In fact, if you flushed a toilet upstairs, water would come down the walls. None, I mean, the dining room, the chandelier, it wasn't electric, it was candles. So it has been a process. The first year and a half, well, I'll say the first several weeks, kids were sleeping in sleeping bags, whether it was in tents or in the guest cottages, everything had to be redone. There was an original huge barn because it was a dairy barn. The original barn burned down in the 50s. And several years ago, we rebuilt a barn so that we had a place to entertain. And that's where so many of our events for the kids and for the families and for family room unions takes place. So it's just been an incredible blessing. What I love is in every room, I mean, nothing is the same. In the, I mean, the floors slope, the walls are rounded, the window sills are a foot and a half thick. Um, it's just, everything has character, which is why I love it. So. 
anyway, it's just been a thrill and a privilege to live here. I want to tell you a story about the couple that made us really see the importance of turning the ordinary moment into an extraordinary moment. We had just had my third daughter and we had just moved again. So at this point I had three children, three and under, and we were moving for the second time in those three years. We had moved into a house and when I tell you we had just moved, walls had come down, we had nail guns everywhere, saws everywhere, floors had been ripped up. I had just told my husband I wanted him to tear the kitchen floor up and put in a brick floor. And Valentine's Day was coming and, and once again it was going to pass by without any notice from Bob and I. And you know, this older couple called us. When I say older couple, they're, they seemed older to us, but now I'm probably that age, but their kids were no longer in the house. And she called us and said, we'd like to help you uh, celebrate Valentine's Day. And I started laughing and I said, number one, we don't celebrate Valentine's Day. And we don't, I mean, even our finances at that point, everything was being saved for the work on the house. You know, our parents didn't live near us so that we didn't even have hope, I mean, help when it came to babysitting. So when she made this suggestion, I kind of blew her off. She called me again and she said, we were serious. Here's the deal, you and Bob are gonna go to your room at five o'clock. You're not allowed out of your bedroom. You're gonna have the kids situated and we have a surprise for you. So we go to our bedroom at five o'clock, they knock on the door and they had given us instructions. You are not allowed to speak to us once you see us. We knew nothing past that. So we're in our bedroom, kind of wondering what's going on downstairs. They knock on the door, we answer the door they turned their backs to us and, and lead the way. There were, they had put rose petals from our bedroom all the way downstairs, which led in front of our one fireplace with this small white table with a white tablecloth. Both of them were fully dressed in like a waiter's outfit. I think they even had chef's hats on. They were very solemn. They wouldn't smile at us. They wouldn't talk to us. They indicated that we were to sit down they poured us drinks. We had a menu. They had typed out a menu sitting for us and they walked out of the room. So what little did we know in our makeshift kitchen, they had made us probably one of the best meals we had ever had. And I think in large part it was because number one, someone else had made it. I had not made it. But more importantly, it, it was like somebody just loved us well and gave us a few minutes of quiet together. So they came out, um, our menus indicated that we were going to be having, I think it was filet that night and mashed potatoes and they had made a special roll and, and this fabulous dessert. Um, there were candles lit all over the place. They had music going. It was a night I will, to this day, I will never forget. And it was ordinary. And when I say ordinary, I mean, you know, we can all make those kind of meals, but they made it spe special in a way that for the rest of our lives, we're never going to forget. And several years later, Bob and I kind of roped in this other couple and we replicated this for another couple. Um, this other couple was having a really hard time. So I called a friend and said, let's surprise them and set them up at dinner in their home. We still talk about it to this day. So what that couple did for us was show me the importance of marking moments and making the ordinary extraordinary. So that's what I'm hoping to do for my husband today. I'm just going to kind of try to replicate it. The food's going to be different. I had asked him what he wanted to eat and I think he's trying to get in shape for my daughter's wedding this fall. So he didn't want the heavy steak, but I've made something that I would make on an ordinary day, but I'm going to make it extra special. So that's what we're heading to do and thank you for joining me. Okay, we're in my kitchen, which is my very favorite place in the house. And tonight I have a special menu. Look, okay, first of all, let me just let you know, I am challenged, computer challenged. Um, my kids would argue that that's not going far enough. I actually don't understand the computer whatsoever. So my daughter, Alex, helped me last night. I wrote off a menu that I'd like. So we're starting out with a first course. He loves a good chopped salad. And I'm making it a little bit different, but we're gonna do chopped salad and I'm going to do a French roll. That couple that made us dinner years ago 
took an ordinary roll and they stuffed it with brie cheese, covered it in butter and a little bit of salt. It was unbelievable. So that'll be this with the salad. Our second course is a chicken and barley soup. And again, to make that ordinary extraordinary, what I've done is we're going to be cutting a piece of pastry in the shape of a heart and cooking that and putting it on top of our soup. The third course will be the chocolate lava cake with vanilla bean ice cream and berries. So that's how we're gonna start. We're gonna go ahead and get that dessert in the oven so that we can get going on everything else. This is in Hungry for Home. It's on page 324. It's called Jane's Lava Cake. And it's because it's my dear friend Jane from years ago gave me this recipe and I've used it ever since. So we start out here. We've taken a stick of butter. I've melted it. You can kind of see it here. I can take it off the heat by now. We're gonna use, I use Ghirardelli chocolate. You can use any kind of chocolate, but Ghirardelli, it's just, it's just really great quality chocolate. So you're gonna do two heaping tablespoons of chocolate mixed in with your butter. I mean, that's heaping but I like it chocolatey. All right, we're gonna get all of that mixed together. And I'm going to add in a teaspoon of vanilla. I put my vanilla in a container like this, but I go through vanilla like a lot of other people go through other things. All right, teaspoon of vanilla. And we're gonna to add to that our sugar, which is one cup of sugar all in there. All right, I might need a spoon actually. Meanwhile, our oven is already turned on and preheating. So here we go, the sugar's melted in with, and I'm doing this so it cools a little bit because we're gonna add two eggs and you don't want your eggs to scramble in this in the heat. So getting all of this mixed up and cooled down a little bit. Okay, to this, the sugar's added. We're gonna go ahead and add a quarter teaspoon of salt. I've got chocolate everywhere. And now we add the eggs. I'll tell you what, I love having chickens. I love having fresh eggs all the time. So add the eggs and get them mixed quickly because it's still warm and you don't want them scrambling in this. Okay, so it's called Jane's Chocolate Lava Cake because back before I was married, when I lived in Richmond, um, before I'd even met Bob, I had a friend named Jane. <laughs> and Jane made this lava cake um, that I've used ever since, and I love it. And I love it because in a dinner party or in a special dinner, you can make them in individual ramekins, which is always really nice to dress things up. Stick a piece of mint on them and some berries with ice cream and it's the perfect dessert. All right, now all of that's been added, so we're gonna add the final thing, which is a half a cup of flour. Mix that up. We've already buttered all the ramekins. So once I have this mixed up, we will put this in the ramekins. I'm trying to make enough of everything I'm making tonight because all of my little helpers, which will be my kids that are on site serving us, I want to be able to feed them afterwards or while we're eating. All right. And it doesn't matter what size ramekin you use. It depends on how thick you want your chocolate dessert, how much ice cream you want to lay on it, layer on it. I mean, that's the great thing. You could make small, little, tiny individual ones. It doesn't all have to be big. And once the oven is at 300, I'm gonna just um, put this, fill this last little one and then I'm gonna do the strawberries. So Bob and I met 25 years ago. I was an assistant attorney general in Richmond and he was working in sales at a company. Um, he had just moved to Richmond and so had I. I think he had even just gotten off a plane and gone directly to a black tie event. Um, he and his new roommate, who was an attorney that I knew as well, decided to host a party and his roommate invited me. Um, I was almost 30, he was younger than me and I had kind of given up on dating. Um, but we met and immediately I think you know, we began to run together afterwards 
and I don't know another way to say it, it was pretty instantaneous. You know, the first, <laughs> at the time, you know, and this is a much longer story, but I'm the oldest of six, and at the time, most of my siblings and my parents were living in my apartment in Richmond for a short season, and he had picked me up for our first date, and he knocked on my screen door, and when he went to open it, it was broken. And my mom answered the door, and he said, hold a second, hold a second. He ran to his car, he got a tool. Don't even ask me why he had a tool in his car, but he fixed the door and then proceeded to give my mom a hug and introduce himself. And from that day on, my mom knew he was absolutely perfect for me, but that, that, if that shows you kind of who Bob is, he's a fixer, he's, um, I don't know anyone more generous than Bob. Um, you know, one of the qualities that I wanted to marry was somebody who would love my family as much as I did. And I would say Bob's done that even more. So what he has done, you know, we proceeded, as many people know, and as my book has talked about, we proceeded after getting married. To, I mean, our first year, we lived in nine different places in our first year. And then after that, we started to flip houses for 16 years, having five kids and moving every 18 months to two years. So he is an extraordinary human being. And the fact that I don't think I take enough time to celebrate him or to celebrate what he's done for our family. But, you know, again, I, I talked to, you know, I was talking to a friend, she's not married and she's divorced or another friend who would love to be married but isn't. Valentine's Day isn't reserved for that. Um, find somebody that you haven't had really been able to appreciate and do something special. It could be your kids. I mean, goodness, make them a fabulous meal that they have no idea. Lock them up in their room and when they come down, there's candied hearts everywhere. Do something that makes people know they're as loved as they are. Okay, one of the fun things about doing a special Valentine's meal is just getting creative. Um, we've done the dessert, but I wanted to do a little something more that's just beautiful. So I was thinking about strawberries. Our favorite place to get chocolate whenever we cook with chocolate is Trader Joe's. That's my like, my little secret. They have these huge pounds of dark chocolate or milk chocolate. Now I prefer milk chocolate, so that's the way we're going for Valentine's Day. But go ahead and crack a few pieces in a ramekin or in a bowl. I stick it, you know, a lot of people take the time, put it over a double boiler with water. I don't do that. I stick it in my microwave. Don't cook it too long because it will get hard on the bottom. Cook it long enough where it looks like it's starting to melt because once you pull it out, it'll continue to heat. So you make it so that it's nice and creamy like this. Pull out a pa uh, some parchment paper like so. Now, when you do your strawberries, make sure your strawberries are dry. After you've rinsed them off, they're dry because the chocolate won't stick otherwise. So you take a strawberry and dip it. Again, any kind of chocolate will work, white chocolate, anything. Dip it and then lay it on the parchment paper. It will harden all by itself. And that way, when it comes time to dessert tonight, the kids can put this in a really fun container when they serve us. It just adds something fun. For Valentine's Day, my dad, after my mom passed away, used to send his three daughters chocolate covered strawberries through the mail. So it holds a special place in my heart. And then we'll set that to the side. In a few minutes, these will be hard. We'll stick them in the fridge and they'll be ready to serve at dinner. Okay, the soup we're gonna make tonight, it is called chicken and barley soup. And what, remember I talked about elevating it, making it a little more special than you ordinarily would? Well, I'm gonna tell a little bit a story. Bob and I were with our kids in Switzerland and the kids were all coming down. They were paragliding down the mountain and Bob and I were sitting in this field, like this wide open field. There was a lake out in the distance and we're in a restaurant, but we were sitting just a little bit outside with these bowls of soup, watching the kids float down. I mean, it was, it's just a moment in time you'll never forget. They bring us these steaming bowls of soup that were chicken and barley soup. But what made them so incredibly special was they had these piece, these pastries on the top and they were in different shapes. And I thought, I can do that. 
So I came home and I've replicated it. So what you do is you go get puff pastry from any store, they're everywhere. Pepperidge Farm sells them, anyone sells them. You open them up, they come frozen. You can open them up like this. Now I'm doubling it over on one side because I wanna make a couple of them a little thicker. So I have flour underneath it because it's gonna to stick to the board. So we've got the pastry. Now, this is where I keep all of my cookie cutters and I had a heart. So we're gonna do a heart since it's Valentine's Day. So take your heart and go ahead and cut some hearts and put them on your cookie sheet like this. Put them on, line them up. So for however many bowls of soup you're gonna want, I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna have my kids here tonight serving us. So we'll have, make some extra for them. Nothing is perfect in a kitchen, especially in a kitchen with five kids and crazy. So I went to find my little brush, you know, so that you can brush on egg wash onto things and I'm missing the stick. So anyway, went through my savoir drawer and I found this, well, it's a coffee scoop for scooping coffee, but I think I can make it work. Voila. So if you can make anything work in a kitchen. All right, so we take a little egg wash and what egg wash is, is take an egg, crack it with a little bit of water, make it mixed up really well, put a little bit on one of these and then brush the top of each one of these puff pastries because what that's gonna do is make it brown on the top and just make it look crisp and beautiful all over the top. All right, you then put these in the oven, follow the box's instructions, put these in. They're gonna raise up because they're puff pastry and we're gonna set each one of these on top of each bowl of soup. So it just adds a little element of surprise and they're really fun. Not to mention, they're good to eat. One of the great things about having a huge family is everyone contributes and it's been like that since they were born. I mean, I'll give you just a small visual. We were in one of our houses and I had left to run errands. So I left my husband with all, it was just the four girls. So you have, you know, four girls, I think probably under seven at that age. He didn't know what to do with them. And the entire kitchen was plywood at the time. And he thought, what am I gonna do? I've gotta work this whole time. So he proceeds, he throws out, okay, I probably shouldn't share this to too many people, but he throws out a box of nails all over the kitchen floor and handles, handles each one of the girls a hammer and just said, start hammering. So each one of them just sat there for hours. And it was the one, my husband jokes that it was the one place in the house that never creaked. Depending on how thick your chocolate lava cake is will depend on how long you cook it. But I would say start to check it between 20 and 30 minutes, somewhere in there. Don't wait until it's cake where it's thick. You want it to still be gooey in the center. I mean, that is kind of why I'm called, my cookies are called Ruth's Barely Baked, because I barely bake things. But it's really important in this dessert particularly. So if we check them, they are totally gooey, not totally gooey, but they're gooier in the center, so they're time to take them out. My favorite soup is chicken and barley soup. It's on page 375 of Hungry for Home. So one of my, so on my Hungry for Home Instagram, I do these tip Tuesdays and every Tuesday I give a tip. Well, one of my favorite tips that I think people loved was how to shred chicken. And in this soup, you need your chicken shredded. It's something that if it called for sh shredded chicken, whether it's chicken salad or soup, I hated making it because you sit there for forever shredding with forks. Somebody told me something and it's amazing. So first of all, I poached my chicken. And what that means is I put all my chicken breasts inside of tin foil and sealed it so that it steamed basically on its own steam at 350 for a, an extended period of time. So I'm taking all the chicken breasts, throwing them into this bowl. I am then, watch this, I'm taking just a mixer now, when I do it, it tends to fly everywhere, so we're gonna try something. I am going to take saran wrap, and I'm just gonna kinda cover it. I've tried this with towels, I've tried it with everything, just because things tend to... All right, let's see how this does. Now watch this. Oh my 
my gosh. Within 30 seconds, your chicken is shredded. It's all ready for soup. All right, in the meantime with this soup, I put a stick of butter in my Crusade, Le Crusade, which is like a Dutch oven. I melted the stick of butter and I put in two stalks of chopped celery and one yellow onion, all chopped up. I went ahead and cooked that down so that it was all soft. I added another stick of butter. So we're getting ready to do. Because we're going to make a roux. All right, so I'm going to make a roux. I mean, most ordinarily, well, people will go ahead and melt the butter and add the flour. I'm just gonna add it all to it. So I've added the additional stick of butter. I'm adding three quarters cup of flour, mixing that in. And what this does is it's gonna thicken your sauce. So it really is kind of like a, it's just really fabulous. I don't know another way to say it. So the butter's gonna finish melting and we are going to cook this on a medium heat, low to medium heat. Get it all incorporated. And we're gonna add a cup and a half of heavy whipping cream. All right, mix this up. As that mixes, it's going to thicken everything. I'm actually gonna use a whisk for this. Now you can see it's already turning into a paste. There it goes. It's almost like, I'm not sure, but it turns into kind of a paste. I'm gonna turn it all the way down. And here is where, let me take it off the heat for a minute. We're gonna add eight cups of chicken stock. I use organic chicken stock. You can use any, you can use low sodium, but I like a lot of flavor. So I use just the regular chicken stock that I get at Costco. I can buy huge boxes. And I keep on hand additional chicken stock because if it gets too thick, you just add a little more chicken stock. All right, let's put it back on. And we're just gonna heat this. Yikes, as I get it everywhere. Now, in the meantime, what I've done, actually what I did the night before, was I cooked all my bacon. So it usually takes about one whole package of bacon. I like to add even extra because I'm a bacon person. Uh, have it all cooked and make sure it's crispy because when you add it to the soup, you want it crispy. And also what we've done, here we go. Let's see how much, five cups of cooked barley. So what you have here is I cooked this ahead of time as well. I cooked up all the bar barley and you just follow the instructions on the package but you want five cups of cooked barley. All of this is ready to assemble. It's really easy to make, and you can make so much of it the day before. All right, this is heating up. Here we go. I'm going to add my chicken. And again, add as much as or as little as you want. I mean, that took two seconds to shred. I used to spend, gosh, ever. So the chicken's in there. And again, as it heats up, it's gonna keep thickening. And then you start to take bacon and crumble it. You know those little cubes that you used to unwrap and stick in your soups? There's something much better that I'm gonna show you. The recipe calls for, I think, four cubes, but I love this. I don't know if you've ever used better than bouillon, but it comes in beef, chicken, and vegetable, and it completely heightens the taste of any soup and then you don't have to use the cubes. But I just take a couple of spoonfuls and I drop it in and uh, it makes all soups better. All right, we're gonna continue to let it heat. And in this process, we're gonna add the barley. I cooked the barley yesterday as well. It's just helpful to have, not do everything on the same day. This is going to be very thick. It hasn't thickened yet because it has to heat up. And then you add salt and pepper to taste. And as if you wanna add more barley, more chicken, more bacon, it's all up to you. But it is one of my family's, if not my family's very favorite soup for the whole winter. I get asked a lot, 
did you just start flipping houses? Where did your story start? And it definitely wasn't flipping houses. I was an assistant Commonwealth attorney, a prosecutor. Um, that was the beginning of my career after law school and that was down in Virginia. I did that till mid to late 20s when I moved to Richmond and became an assistant attorney general. At that point, I met Bob and within months of getting married, he said, you know, my dad's asked me to come work in a family business up outside of Philadelphia. Can we move up there? Which for me was a huge shock. I mean, even though I knew I always wanted to be a stay at home mom, you know, going from trial work to all of a sudden, you know, I had to wave into the bar up in Pennsylvania. That took time. Then I found myself pregnant and living in nine places the first year. So all of that was really hard and formative for me in my identity. And it was a hard first few years. We got to Philadelphia and realized we didn't have the money to find a house. So in our house in Philadelphia, or Richmond had not sold. We met with a realtor. I think we'd been married about a year. We'd moved about nine times, like I said. And we met with a realtor and told her where we wanted to live. And she burst out laughing and she said, you can't afford to live here. Two weeks later, she came to us and said, are you afraid of hard work? And it was sliding off the foundation. It was about 150 years old. And she said, this is what you can afford. And at the time I had a brand new baby and just, I think I burst into tears into the house and I thought, there's no way. I, I am not cut for this. And Bob and I went out for breakfast and uh, this is an example of who Bob is. Things don't scare him and uh, they do me. <laughs> so we went out to breakfast and I mean, I'm literally just crying the whole breakfast and he said, we can do it. Let's go to Home Depot. And we went to Home Depot and literally had to teach ourselves. He didn't know how to do carpentry. He didn't know how to do electric or tear out floors or lay hardwood floors or, I didn't know how to hang wallpaper or paint or design. And we would start every house that we flipped because we moved every 18 months to two years for 16 years. And all five of our kids are born in different homes. And so before each home, we would go into a, um, a Barnes and Noble, because you know how they have the long wall of all the magazines with house pictures or house magazines? We didn't want to spend money on a magazine. So we would sit in their little cafe and we would take off magazines off the shelf. We would sit, we'd have coffee. Each one of us would have a yellow legal pad and we would write down all our ideas for the upcoming house. And then we would compare notes. And the wonderful thing was how, what we learned very quickly was he would make a list of what he wanted, what his priorities were, I would make mine, and then we would have a sheet that were our no compromise. This is what Ruth wanted, <laughs> this is what Bob wanted. But it was so helpful before going into these huge projects to be able to already know our boundaries and what the other person's needs and desires were. So that when we didn't go into it, we weren't butting heads for 18 months. And it was, it was really great. Mine ordinarily all had to do with the kitchen um, or colors. And um, Bob's list was usually about two to three things long and mine was about two pages long. But that's how we would start out every project. And I think it has served us well. If you can get through a house renovation, let alone as many as we've done, and be stronger after it than you were when you started, you've done well and you've figured out how to do the process. And it's putting the other person's needs and their desires for the project ahead of your own. So that has really served us well in every area of marriage, especially when you throw into it having five kids and five little kids always wanting your time. You know, Bob would get home from work at night. I mean, this is how it happened every time. He would get home from work by 5.30 spend till 7.30 when we kids put the kids down and he would work till about 1.30 on the house. And he would be up at work and heading to work at 5.30 in the morning. And this would go on for months. So, you know, this is why I want to take the time to celebrate today in Valentine's Day. And maybe it's because too, it's our 25th wedding anniversary a couple of months ago. But I just want that, you know, to continue to celebrate. He has done it so well and he has prioritized our marriage and the kids in such a way that it deserves celebrating. 
final thing to prepare, remember I mentioned those special French rolls that that couple made us? Well, I went to a French bakery this morning and I picked up some French rolls and I'm gonna show you what they did. All right, here's what they did. Take these French rolls. What you're going to do is you're going to cut a hole because we are going to dig out the center and then put the lid back on and we are gonna stuff it with brie. But when you cut a hole, don't go straight down because if you go straight down and you go to put the lid back on, it's just gonna fall inside. It needs to be at an angle. So you cut in a circle at an angle like that. So what happens is that a lid's gonna come off, but see how it's at an angle? We're then gonna take the sides and pinch it close. You don't wanna empty it totally because then you're gonna lose the bread. So basically you're making a big cavern. You're then gonna take brie and slice up pieces of brie first. It's coming apart. We're gonna take this little tool with butter and you're gonna kind of butter everything. Take that piece of brie and stick it inside the roll like that. You're gonna take that lid and you're gonna put it on top and you're gonna brush the whole roll with your butter. And to finish it off, I went, I went to a store today. I actually went to a few stores because it's not, I don't know, for some reason I couldn't find it everywhere. It's Malden sea salt and it's in flakes. And so you're gonna take these little flakes and you're just gonna drizzle it. Oftentimes I use this flake salt onto some fun cookies that I make, but they'll be a great addition to these rolls. We're then gonna bake this at 350 for maybe 10 to 15 minutes and serve them hot. And when they get cut in two, it's gonna be a gooey mess of cheese and butter and bread. A perfect thing for a big old bowl of soup. Thick they are. I mean, these are gorgeous. And you're gonna sit this heart right down on the bowl of soup. We'll let them cool here for a little bit. And now we're gonna go get the den ready. I've decided we're going to have dinner for table for two in front of the fireplace tonight. So let's go get that table ready. So this is the room we're gonna transform into my mini restaurant. And the great thing, I mean, besides saving money and not going to a fancy restaurant and being waited on and all that kind of stuff, you can do it anywhere. You can turn any room in your house into a little restaurant. I've even, I've done it before even in our bedroom or you can do it in the kids' room, make a picnic on the ground. But for today's purposes, we're gonna turn our den, which is this room where we spend most of our time, into a little table for two. I'm gonna enlist my daughter, who's gonna help me move all the furniture that's in the center of the room into our other, into our living room, which is right there. And we're gonna bring a little table in. So what I use my dining room for today, instead of, this is, I mean, this is ordinarily where we sit, which is really fun because we have a huge hearth in here as well. But I'm using it as a staging st station before we go into the den. So I've pulled everything in here from our glassware and our plates and our soup bowls to the little va <coughs> vases that we're gonna use. Um, I was trying to figure out, you know, what color scheme do I want? I like a clean look. So I actually went, I picked up two white ranunculus, ranunculus, I, I always get that messed up, flowers. We're gonna use those in these really sweet little vases. And then I got this rose here and I'm gonna peel off all the petals and put those all over the table. So really the only touch of color is gonna be that pink. And then we've got these champagne glasses, which I picked these up in a state sale years ago. And I mean, how often do you get to pull them out? So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna put a little raspberry in. I can't drink champagne because I get migraines, but I'm gonna put a little seltzer water with a splash of pomegranate juice. So that's what's gonna go in these. And we will use these and move it all in there. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and cut the flowers. That way they're ready. Kind of measure the stem. Where Now cut all the stems at an angle so they get the most water in them. There we go. All right. 
I think we're ready to go start moving into the den. True confessions. You never know what's under a tablecloth. Um, last night, actually, this morning before Bob left for work at the crack of dawn, I said, I need a card table. <laughs> well, we only had one. It was in the bottom of our garage, and it's disgusting. I had to wipe it all down. I mean, it's coming apart. That's where the magic of a great white tablecloth comes in, and you throw it on, and you would never know what's underneath it. So you don't even have to have a great table. A cloth will cover all of that. Any chance I get to pull this gift out, a friend of mine, she's the godmother of some of my children, from the time they were little, that's when she started gifting me these, but every year she would send me a sterling silver napkin holder. They're all vintage and none of them match. So it's really fun to pull something different out that kind of celebrates her and celebrates Valentine's Day. So what happens sometimes is these candlesticks don't stand up straight. They wobble, they lean. Here's a little trick. Take a lighter or a match and hold it to the bottom until the max, the, until the wax starts to melt. See how it's melting? And then just set it right in and it will stand straight up. You won't have any problem. I grabbed this picture of Bob and I from a wedding. Uh, we were dancing and someone caught it and it's always been a favorite of mine. And then a little color for the table. Do you know how hard it was on Valentine's Day to find somebody who would sell me one rose? <laughs> Everywhere I went, they were like, you can get a dozen for $50. <laughs> So after flipping houses all those years, my oldest daughter was heading off to college. And you know, it's just like, and many moms understand this, if they've gone to work and they begin to stay home, but that identity gets hit. What, am, what, am I, what is my value? What is my purpose anymore? And she had left, and here I had gone from being a trial lawyer to flipping houses and being a stay-at-home mom, but I could feel almost like the tectonic plates begin to move underneath me. Who am I gonna be? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna still have 25 years of life after my kids leave. It just doesn't dawn on you when you have young kids. You think, I've got forever. You don't. So even though I had four kids left, that oldest one leaving started a process in me. And I had an uncle visiting and he had asked me some questions, but it really began to start my thinking on what is next. And out of that process was born a book. And I didn't really think initially I had anything to say. Um, a number of people had said, you need to write a book, you need to write a book. You know, unless you have something that people need to hear and see, I didn't necessarily think I had that. Um, but after listening to a number of people asking and talking to me, I decided to write a book on how to create intentional family culture. I knew that that was really the one thing I was passionate about anymore. And how do you bless people in and through your home? I think it's a lost art. I don't even know that people think about that anymore. We get too busy. We're busy with our kids. We're busy with our own social life. We're you know, working nonstop, taking the time to slow down. And that art of intentionally creating a family culture that is healthy and that loves each other and that loves people in and through your house. So what I did is I wrote a book called Hungry for Home and we took our farm over the course of a year 
And we started with family, well, we gave our story first, but then it's family traditions, family recipes, gardening, entertaining, and decorating over the course of a year. And how can you recreate that in your own home? So that's what the book is. And it has been, oh, it's been a journey. And I feel I was, it was a love letter from me to anybody who's willing to read it. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. All right, we're having an early Valentine's party. <laughs> Valentine's party? Yes. For who? So go, it's just you. go, go into the hey, living, go into hey, the you. den. It's you. Go into the den. Hi, These are our waiters. What's up with the skirt? <laughs> he just doesn't, doesn't have a skirt on. He has a waiter's outfit on. A waiter's outfit, I love All it. All right, go into, the, go into the den. Okay. We'll see you in there. I'm gonna introduce you to the crew, which are my three kids that are still home right now. I have another one who's swimming right now. So these are the ones that get to help us tonight. I have my son-in-law, Chris. Alex is my oldest. Hi. And Anders, who's my freshman in high school, who's going to be a waiter. This is what we got going. You got, you got a waiter outfit. Good job. All right, so they're gonna take care of us in the living room and I'm not stepping foot in the kitchen again. In fact, I'm not doing any of these dishes. So I'm gonna go join my husband. Thank you, I love you. Love you. What is here? What is this? Do you remember these? They're the brie wrapped rolls. Oh, Thank you. Where, where was it that we had these? Look at this. <laughs> Look at that service. Look at that. Mr. Football player serving us rolls. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, this is Anders. amazing. All right. I want to do a toast. That's a picture of me when I was 25. 10? <laughs> All right. I wanted to do this dinner again. Thank you. Just to tell you how much I loved you and appreciated you. And, uh, we celebrated our 25th anniversary this year, but I thought it would be fun to recreate that dinner that they did for us. So. And that was actually an amazing moment when somebody, it's just, just friends that would just surprise us with a day like that. Yeah. So this is amazing that you did this tonight. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheers. I love you. Love you. By the way, usually the waiter puts the napkin on the lap of his cup. Mm -hmm. They haven't already done so. You can work on that. Are you barefoot? You're barefoot. <laughs> You're barefoot. He doesn't need those standards. <laughs> he does not. He would not be hired. Bread and mm -hmm. barley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, chocolate lava cake and ice cream. Oh, that's, that's going to be a great Did you read your uh, menu? Excuse I me, did. it has a little message on the bottom. You're amazing. Thank you for a special surprise. Mm -hmm. And as we say Valentine's Day to us is every day, mm -hmm. we don't need a, an occasion to celebrate it. So it's even better that it's not on Valentine's Day. It says for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Grab that. Thank you. You always serve the lady first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. We don't need anything. Awesome. We 
might need oh, spoons. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Could we get some spoons, please? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Homeworthy, for joining us today. Thank you for celebrating Bob with me. Um, he makes life. I don't know. You're my home. And so I just want to thank you and I wanted to share that with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I love you. Love you. Thanks for watching. For more homeworthy content, be sure to like and subscribe.